I often ask people who are in early treatment, what do you need to change in order to, to have a different kind of life? And many of them early on understand, I have to change everything. How do you change everything, right? I mean, that, that seems impossible in the beginning. Coming here is a jumpstart into a different kind of life, which, which is a, a life of recovery. We wanted it to feel warm and inviting, to look like a home. Folks coming in the door before knowing anything else, they feel like someone cares about them and loves them enough to provide this great space for healing. It's not just the building, though this is a wonderful building. It's not just the setting, and this is a beautiful setting. This is a place where somebody can really focus on themselves and learn the tools that are available to help strengthen them to go back into their life and go back into their own communities, but stronger and equipped to be successful. We offer two levels of care. One is a detoxification unit and the other is a residential treatment unit. We offer both levels of care under the same roof so we can essentially eliminate that in-between period where patients are vulnerable to relapse. When people come to the Center for Hope and Healing, they'll have group therapy and individual therapy with licensed therapists. They'll have mindfulness meditation and yoga. What's really important and what we'll help people with is to bridge them back into community-based living and treatment or peer support in those communities. Here we want to treat the whole patient. We want to take a holistic approach to treating substance use disorder. Being a part of WVU Medicine offers us amazing access to doctors, treatment, and research. From day one, working with WVU Medicine, the goal was to provide the highest quality care for people in West Virginia who desperately need it, and we're not so worried about the bottom line. Any West Virginian that, that needs help can get help at the Center for Hope and Healing. As awful and crippling and detrimental as addiction is, it can still be overcome. Recovery is a lifelong journey of doing things differently than you've been doing them. And that journey starts here. People with substance use disorder are not bad people trying to get good. They're sick people trying to get well. We want to be successful. We want to have families. We want to move forward in our lives. Addiction takes all of that from us. We do recover. We can recover. I'm living proof of that. People who suffer from addiction deserve the best. They deserve to come to a place just like you would if you went to a brand new cancer center, just like you would if you went to a brand new children's hospital. We'll celebrate the fact that you've decided that you want help and we want to give it to you because this place is for you. Hello, my name is Steve Smith, and I'm president of EB5 Visa Fast and EB5 Coast to Coast. I'm going to explain why you should choose to invest in one of our addiction treatment center offerings for your EB5 investment. Number one, demand for addiction treatment services was strong before COVID, and since the onset of COVID, demand has skyrocketed. On the supply side, Treatment services for addiction patients has not kept pace. Drug overdose is now the leading cause of death, and every day, 275 people die from it. Number two, our track record is long and unblemished. We have opened more than 45 treatment centers in 23 states over the last six years, and all have succeeded and none have closed down. Furthermore, all jobs that were originally projected to be created were in fact ultimately created. Over the last 10 years, through our regional centers operating in 41 states, we have sponsored over 400 EB-5 investors and their families. Our investors have a 100% petition approval rate. Not a single one has been denied approval. Number three, we are not related to the hospitality industry, such as a restaurant or a hotel. As I'm sure you have seen, many restaurants and hotels have had to shut down due to wave after wave of the latest COVID strain. Contrast that with the business of addiction treatment, also known as mental health and substance use disorder treatment, business has never been stronger. 
There is nothing on the horizon that would indicate a let up in demand for this type of medical service. Depending on the location, about 80 to 90% of our revenue comes from insurance, either private insurance or the government insurance program known as Medicaid. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, is the chance for expedited processing of your EB-5 petition. What exactly does expedited processing mean? It means that USCIS has determined that your investment meets a very certain limited set of criteria, which warrants your cutting to the front of the line. Your petition is placed at the very front of the queue to be adjudicated before any non-expedited petitions are adjudicated. The actual adjudication of the petition is no different than the adjudication of non-expedited petitions. In the case of addiction treatment, USCIS has determined that the opioid epidemic is a humanitarian crisis of national interest. So far, all four of our investors, all four of our first investors have been granted expedited processing. To be fair, I should say that our first two investors were initially denied, but then we appealed. And only a few weeks after we appealed, USCIS reversed its decision. We don't expect to have to go through this denial and appeal process again, because our third and fourth investors have been granted expedited processing right off the bat without any initial denial. More investors have invested with us, filed their petitions and requested expedited processing. And we expect them to be granted just the same as our first, as our third and fourth investor. If history is a reliable guide, the adjudication timeframe for each petition after USCIS has granted expedited processing should be two to three months, although USCIS is notoriously impossible to predict. If your petition were to follow the same timeline as our investors number three and four, your request for expedited processing would be approved about two months after application. And if your petition were to, were to be approved two or three months later, this would mean that you could potentially be approved to apply for your entry visa or adjustment of status in about six months from now, assuming you could file your I-526 petition within the next 30 days. The amount of the investment we are asking for this offering is $750,000 plus the admin fee. The minimum investment for the current EB-5 rules is only $500,000. So why are we requiring $250,000 more than the minimum? Because we have only nine slots available in our current offering and at least two or three are already taken. In other words, this investment should be considered only by those who would place a premium and additional value on the potential for expedited processing. Now I will talk about the return on investment we are estimating you will receive. The investment you would be making would be into two addiction treatment centers. The first is in Morgantown, West Virginia, and the second one is in Mount Morris, Pennsylvania. Even though they are in different states, the driving distance between the two facilities is only about 20 minutes. Morgantown will be an outpatient clinic, meaning that clients come in for treatment for some part of the day, then return to their daily lives. Mount Morris, on the other hand, will be a residential center where clients stay for up to 30 days or even longer to receive long-term treatment. The $750,000 is an investment and is expected to earn a return on investment or ROI. Each investor will own 0.5% of the parent company, which owns both centers, which means each investor will be entitled to 0.5% of the combined operating profit of the two centers. As a minimum, we have set a preferred return of 2% annually on the investment. In other words, the minimum amount each $750,000 investment will receive at 2% annually is $15,000 annually. 
Both centers are owned by my partner, Doug Leach and me. Doug grew up in Morgantown and is excited to open these centers in his backyard because he knows from firsthand experience the desperate need for both of them. Doug's company, Ascension Recovery Services, which he founded in 2016, is based in Morgantown. And Doug is a hometown hero for all the things he has done for Morgantown, the state of West Virginia, and many other communities. If you have not seen them already, I highly recommend you watch the videos where Doug is interviewed about his business, his life, and his personal journey of recovery. Doug's company has opened over 45 treatment centers in 23 states, and his clients include West Virginia University, the city of Boston, and various hospitals and other healthcare organizations. I met Doug almost two years ago, and I have been a real estate developer for almost 35 years, and in the last 10 years, I have been focused on the EB-5 space. Over the last 10 years, my company has sponsored through its affiliated regional centers, over 400 EB-5 investors and their families. I'm proud to say we have a 100% success rate. All our investors have received approval of their petitions or they are simply waiting. Unfortunately, some of our investors are stuck in limbo until Congress renews the regional center program. None of our investors have ever been, ever been denied approval of any petition. Let me digress now into the status of the regional center program. To everyone's surprise, Congress failed to extend the program last June, resulting in the program lapsing and becoming ineffective as of June 30th, 2021. This is very unfortunate for the tens of thousands of EB-5 investors who invested under the authority of the of regional center legislation. Currently, there's very strong lobbying effort <clears throat> to convince Congress not to leave these EB-5 investors stuck in limbo. And indeed, the members of Congress should feel a deep moral imperative to allow these investors who did everything right to continue their many years journey along the EB-5 path toward achieving their American dream. Nobody can tell for sure, but a reasonable guess is that Congress will renew the regional center program perhaps in February, two months from now. Another expectation is that the investment amount will be increased as it was in 2019 before a judge invalidated the new rules, which raised the minimum investment amount to $900,000. Nobody can say for sure what the new minimum amount will be, but certainly it will be more than $500,000 and could be increased again to as much as $900,000 as it was in 2019. So currently, with the regional center program on hold indefinitely, the only EB-5 path available is the direct EB-5 program. Our, our offering is based on the direct EB-5 program. If you choose to invest with us and USCIS grants expedited processing to your application, you could potentially be ready to apply for your entry visa or adjustment of status in as little as six months from now. The date on which you actually receive your entry visa is subject to several variables, such as the availability of appointments at a U.S. consulate near you and the interview process you must go through to receive your entry visa. Some consulates remain closed due to COVID, and they could decide to shut down again if there is a COVID resurgence. Going through the process of obtaining your entry visa is a matter you should discuss with your immigration lawyer. But for most people, this process takes about one to four months. After you receive approval for your entry visa, you can buy your plane ticket. On the day you arrive into the US, you will be issued your conditional green card and you can live and work and your children can go to school anywhere you like. As you approach the two year anniversary of your entry into the US, and the issuance date of your 
conditional green card, we will begin to prepare your application for a permanent green card, also known as the I-829 petition. Within the 90-day window that ends at your two-year anniversary, your immigration lawyer, with our assistance to prepare all the necessary materials, will file your I-829 petition. And when it is approved, you will be done. You will have completed the full EB-5 process and will have your permanent green card. Your investment will likely remain invested for at least five years. During these five years, you will receive your share of profits from ownership, or at least the minimum preferred return. We are estimating that your return on investment, or ROI, will be approximately 2.5% annually for the first five years, which is about $93,000 over the five-year period on your $750,000 investment. After five years, or the filing date of your I-829 petition, whichever is later, and we call this the trigger date, the preferred return on your investment increases. If your petition is granted expedited processing, you may be filing your I-829 petition only three weeks from now, which means therefore that the trigger date for your investment would be five years from now, since the trigger date is the later of five years or your I-829 filing date. As of the trigger date, the preferred return on your investment increases to 5% for the first year and then to 6% on the first anniversary of the trigger date. 6% of $750,000 equals $45,000. And since this is ROI, it is above and on top of the return of your $750,000 investment. Every anniversary, the return increases 1% until your investment is returned. As you can tell, this creates a strong incentive for us to return your investment to you as soon as possible after five years, since bank financing is likely to be less expensive. As I conclude this presentation, I must remind you that the granting of expedited processing is not and cannot be guaranteed. But I can tell you that if you decide to invest with us and request it, the justification for expedited processing will be the same as the justification that supported our previous investors' requests. And considering what a huge problem addiction is in this country, and the fact that President Biden is very focused on solving this problem, it is hard to imagine that USCIS would change its determination that the addiction crisis is indeed a humanitarian crisis of national interest. Doug and I are long-term players in this business and plan to continue doing it for many more years. <clears throat> Looking over the horizon, there is nothing to indicate there will be a let up in demand for addiction treatment services. We believe this business model to be as solid as any other, and we hope you will decide to join us on this venture to tackle America's addiction epidemic. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for the presentation. So um, we have a number of questions. Um, Robert and Steve, would you like to juggle which ones first you'd like to? Sure. Take? Let me let me uh, let me uh, let me let me uh, uh, offer a couple of clarifications. I said at one point that the investors could could get their uh, would file their their eight two nine petition in three weeks. Of course, I meant three years. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, and then at this point, uh, you know, I made this video last a month ago, and we actually have eight approvals now and no denials. And they they roll in, it seems like about once a week now. So 
Uh, well, wait, let's clarify. That's approvals of requests for expediting. Yes, not yes, thank you. Correct, correct. And we don't, we, and just to be clear, we don't have any approvals of the 526 petition, any 526 petitions. And I should say that uh, I'm not aware. I don't think any project has received approval of a 526 petition that was filed after June 30th. That's the date that the regional center program lapsed. And Robert, is that, are you aware of any 526 approvals since June 30th? No. Yeah. Not that have been filed since June 30th. No. Yeah. yeah. There have been a few of direct cases that have been filed maybe years ago that the agency went and dug out of the pile of papers. Yeah. But what, what we do know is that my eight petitions mm -hmm. are at the front of the queue waiting to be adjudicated, unless there's any other expedited projects, but I'm not aware of any other uh, projects that have received expedited, uh, a granting of expedited processing. Steve, I don't know if you mentioned this, but I think it's important to clarify that, you know, we certainly, as you mentioned, we hope that Congress will enact some law that protects and restores the, the opportunities for the investors who already invested before June 30 and mm -hmm. filed an I-526. I mean, we hope that those investors get protected like that. If that does happen, then all of those investors will come streaming back into the queue and will be ahead of all of the investors who filed I-526 petitions after June 30. But I believe that those that have been designated for expediting as those have been for your projects will remain at the very front of the entire queue. That is a huge difference because those, all those investors who, who are in that queue that is now on hold were being adjudicated on a pace of about four years to get their 526 approved. So uh, if those get restored, the difference between expedited processing and not expedited processing could be four or five years difference. Is that Robert mainly countries that are in retrogression? Would it affect any countries that are outside of retrogression? Well, everybody was subject to uh, a processing time of four to five years. Okay. And the, the immigration service had decided um, not that long before that it would um, put people who were going to have a long wait for a visa number, which is only people born in mainland China. Mm -hmm. Those people would be decided later. So they might even take longer than what was then the typical four to five year adjudication period. Um, so, but, 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 but the four to five years was still applicable to people who were not born in mainland China, everybody else. Okay. okay. Now we have to clarify if Congress never acts to protect those people who already previously invested, and that would be a shame and a terrible thing. If that happens, then only investors in direct projects, almost all of which would be the people who invested after uh, June 30 of 2021, would, they would be the only people who could get adjudicated. And you would think that USCS would then be able to adjudicate those quicker than they would have been able to adjudicate all those piles of people who would have just lost out. But we don't know for sure because we understand that USCIS has been siphoning adjudicators away from the EB-5 program so that even the smaller group of investors who are you know, in this direct program since June 30 might take quite a while to get adjudicated, maybe a year, maybe longer, could easily be longer than that. So far, I haven't heard, as Steve said, I haven't heard of any investor who filed after June 30 under this direct program uh, who've gotten an adjudication. And we haven't had time to get even the expedited cases adjudicated because we only started getting the, the approval of the expediting about a month ago. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. 
So, um, Steve, I know you're answering some of the um, questions. <laughs> would you also like to, um, would you like me to read some of them out? Um, sure. Yeah, is that, so uh, the attendees are, okay. So, um, so I'm very familiar. So some people are concerned in the time frame. Um, we pretty much got like a month left at w w expectation of 18th of Feb. Potentially there's a discussion that there might be an increase and it, it's quite difficult to get your source of funds in place um, less than a month. What advice would you give Robert and Steve to those um, investors that are concerned about, you know, getting all their documents in order uh, if there is a potential price increase? You know, all I can say is work hard to get it filed before then. Um, I think the chances of a legislation that increases the amount for February 18th are actually quite low. Um, but it, it, it is the next point in time where legislation that some EB-5 uh, regional set of renewal legislation could be included. Um, I don't think it will, mm -hmm. but but it could. So. All you can do is try to beat it. Um, but, you know, my guess is if it, if it does happen, it's gonna be not that much more than the 750 that Steve is requiring. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be that big of an impact if it's, you know, 850, 900. Okay. So, so you get a lot of investors, Steve and um, Robert, which are, trying to do both at the same time, appoint an attorney and also select a project. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, th th they kind of want the perfect project and they want to get the perfect attorney to file. And, th you, you know, it's like trying to run before you walk sometimes. So like, what would you advise with these people? Because we have that a lot where it's like, they want to get, you know, com do a combination at the same time. Surely they can start the legal process because that source of fund, doesn't get wasted at all. You know, what would you say to that, Rob? Because that's me and my absolutely. These are these are parallel tracks. Yes. You can you can retain an attorney who will assist you in putting together the source of funds, which is the key thing that the investor does. Mm -hmm. uh, that that is independent. That effort is independent of where you make the investment. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can get started on that while you're analyzing which project to invest in and organizing the actual transaction to make the investment so that mm. they converge. And you, when you've got both of them done, the documents about the source of funds and you've completed, actually made the investment, then you can file. Yeah, because I, I wanna expand on that because we have a lot of investors and I know that they, they believe their source of funds are very straightforward, a salary and, and an income, but they don't realize how much effort that goes in to the preparation of source of funds to meet immigration criteria. So they right. think, oh, source of funds can be done in a couple of days, but they don't realize the amount of paperwork you do. Perhaps you can explain, you know, portray yeah. what goes in. I mean, if you, let's just talk about a few examples of what might be perceived as simple uh, sources of funds. Let's say that you really are just using um, let's say you're, you've got one property that you're going to sell to generate the amount. Well, that's great. That, you know, that's going to be one transaction that you control and you can get it done and you will be able to generate the documents that show what you sold and how much money you got for it. Mm -hmm. But, but what, you know, how does the government know that you didn't buy that property with the proceeds of drug trafficking? And so you have to prove where did you get the money to buy the property in the first place? And, and, and that may have been the result of a sale of some other property. And you may need to show where did you get the money to buy that property? Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, this could go potentially almost indefinitely backward in time. And, um, you know, there's only so far that people normally can go to actually with to get documents and at some point you have to kind of resort to a rule of reason and do the best you can and show and explain why you can't document any further uh, and, and you're just 
trying to establish to the adjudicator that you are not a bad guy and you're using legitimate funds and you didn't have any bad source of funds. And, and it's more than likely, more likely than not, that these things are all true. Um, but let's talk for a second about, um, say, income as a source of funds. So you've been earning the same income, you know, over years, uh, doing something like, hey, practicing law or whatever. Uh, that would be good, but you, you have to show that history of income and the money accumulating in your accounts and uh, some evidence of how much money you were spending to support yourself to show that money really was accumulating from that income and hasn't been brought in from the side through the proceeds of drug trafficking or something. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It so it's does. a little more complicated than just throwing in a few pay stubs, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Steve, we have a question for you um, in terms of your project. Um, can can you can you as a sponsor uh, take payments over a four month period? Because it's not like everyone has seven hundred fifty thousand in their bank account, and if they do, I'll be very concerned. Uh, because sure. <laughs> So um, what, what would you say to those investors? Well, there's, I, I think that's a, that's a two-part answer. Number one, if they could pay 500000 at least, then, uh, then I think USC, USCIS would be satisfied. We, we could wait three months uh, for that. And, and Robert, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's that, what USCIS cares about really is, is the two fifty. I'm sorry, the 500, the initial 500,000 mm -hmm. and less about the 250,000. And is there even a, is there even a possibility that the source of funds on the extra 250,000 is, is not important or not even? Um, no, you're going to have to show where all of the money came from. from okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, but so, but so, yeah. it is true mm -hmm. that, um, I mean, so, so if somebody, if you, well, it'd be a two-part thing. One, Steve, you would have to decide whether you are willing to let somebody invest less than the full 750000 on the front end. That would be a choice you have. Mm -hmm. If you allow that choice, then somebody could invest conceivably if you allow as little as $500,000 on the front end. Um, but they would need to include evidence of where the other 250000 is going to come from because that initial filing needs to prove the source of that. They may not have liquidated the assets yet that will be used for the other 250, but they will need to show where it all came from because that needs to be part of the original file. Right. So Sam, for example, somebody might have some real estate that they need to liquidate. Mm -hmm. And so if that were the case, we would need evidence of the value of that real estate and appraisal, for example, to show that the investor owns the real estate, that they put it on the market, and here and and then we can we can deduce the the likely uh, net proceeds from the sale of that real estate. So we we would the investor would need to show all that all that evidence to show that it's it's likely coming in say three months. Yep. So say, for example, you have an investor, they, they write yeah. the 500000 And you know what, let me, let me just add to that. And, and Robert, correct me if I'm wrong, but in, in that scenario, even if it was less than $500,000, let us say it was half, let's say they, the investor could put 375000 down and show that 375 was going to be paid in three months, that investor could file their petition immediately. Mm -hmm. is that, well, is that right? let, let me just say that I am, I strongly advise any investor against doing that. I strongly advise an investor to put up the entire $500,000 before they file their I-526. Strongly advise that. Um, there are, I mean, it's possible that there, there are theories and arrangements under which uh, an investor could seek to qualify. <clears throat> when they don't put up all of it at the very beginning, they would need to show where all the rest of it is going to come from. Just as I said, if they were holding back uh, 250 from the 750,000. Um, and it might work, but USCS has some demanding rules about this 
And um, we, the, the one thing that's pretty clear is you could do it if the investor made a promise to pay the remaining amount and literally legally secured that promise by pledging the the other property that they have and showing that the that that the uh, foreclosure value of that property uh, is the remaining is at least the amount that they have left to put in, and that's a tough thing to show and do and arrange. So I just strongly advise people go ahead, figure it out, get it done, make, invest to five hundred thousand at least. Yeah. And you could choose to require the 750,000, especially if you've got enough investors who, who are ready to do that. Because also the concern is, you know, when, you, when you're liquidating assets, it's really much dependent on the buyer, um, wiring the remaining balance to fund the remaining balance for you for your project. Is there an option of someone gifting them the money robber in terms of if they have friends and family in the US that could gift them that amount to, you know, cover up the remaining balance. It, would you advise? It is, totally, it is totally fine to put together multiple sources. Mm -hmm. So I've got $300,000 in cash available and I have a, an uncle in the US who's willing to fund and give me the other 200 or 450,000, then um, that's okay. A gift can be uh, used, but now we're going to have to prove where did the uncle get that money? And so it's almost as if he were the investor. We have to document all the way back to where he legally obtained that money mm -hmm. uh, in order to show that it was not illegally obtained. Okay. But generally speaking, um, if there's someone who's got a big appetite for the US, they, they should have some kind of they, I, I generally find they have some kind of relatives in the US and there's yeah. a documentation. So that that's a really good option. Um, mm -hmm. I, I recommend to a lot of investors here. Steve, mm -hmm. while you're tapping away, I, I can see you're tapping away, which is brilliant. Um, so we have a, a number of people here that are very concerned about some of the tax returns because not everyone does a tax return of a million plus. You know, sometimes... They will probably do a tax return based on their jurisdiction. Um, do you need a complete tax clearance from from the country of jurisdiction for, for them to file? So, if they're from India or Pakistan, do you need a full, you know, full documents to say they've completed the tax and this is how their source of income is? It, or because that worries a lot of investors, you know, like from, especially from like Pakistan. Right. Well, I mean, the government requires that it not be illegally obtained. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the U.S. government could say that somebody who obtained their money by partially by not paying taxes that were due to their country yeah. uh, did not legally obtain that money. So it is best by far to show that what money you did invest came from uh, transactions on which the taxes were paid as, as due. Now, not everybody has to pay taxes. I mean, I, you know, we have clients who have invested from countries that don't have income tax requirements at all. And, um, you know, that, that the adjudicators at USCIS have become aware of that in the early going. You know, we had to really prove to them that there was no tax requirement because you, the, invest, the, the adjudicators are used to seeing documentation of tax returns filed by the investors. And that's, that's among the list of documents that, that the regulations say normally should be filed, tax returns for the last five years. But for some people, there just is no yeah. tax obligation. There are no tax returns. And we just prove that by showing what the law is for that country. And, and that's, that's okay. I guess that's a really good example for certain people in the Middle East where there's mm -hmm. sort of taxations. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that really works. Okay, um, so we've answered that question. Um, Steve, a lot of people are asking for a bit more, you know, in terms of, you know, you have done the regional centre project and the direct project, you know, 
what's your preference at the moment, having experienced direct regional centers, direct to gate? Well, in, in a sense, uh, it doesn't really matter what my opinion is because uh, <laughs> we only have one option anyway. Uh, you know, I, it's, I, I don't have an opinion. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the tens of thousands of petitioners, applicants, who are now in limbo because of the, the regional center program, I think they should absolutely be allowed to, uh, to proceed and, and complete the process. Um, whether or not the regional center program is renewed, I, I don't have an opinion either way. Mm -hmm. I, could, I could take it or leave it. Okay. Well, I do so notice, go ahead. I, I think the it. point though, Steve, is that if somebody is thinking, okay, Either I play the game as it now is, the only way it can be, and with this option of expediting, I want to choose that. Or maybe I'll just wait for renewal of the program so that I can use an indirect investment that goes through some special purpose entity and gets loaned to some big, huge construction project. And I get to take, claim the, the job creation that arises from the expenditure of all the money in that deal, which was the most popular type of investment uh, in the, you know, up until June 30. Sure. Um, and so okay. yeah. one, there's, the, you got to look at, okay, is that ever going to be? Is that, oh, and nobody can tell you that that is going to happen. And I, I'm, I'm getting increasingly concerned that it may never happen, that wow. there may be no renewal of, you know, of the regional center legislation that allows new investment. Now, certainly, you know, parties in the industry hope that happens. I mean, for seven years, I was the vice president of IIUSA, the Industry Association of Regional Centers, and we certainly were lobbying, and, and that organization is continuing to advocate for the renewal of that program. Mm -hmm. But and, and that might be fun, but, you know, one, it might not happen. Two, even if it does, any renewal of that legislation is going to come with an increase in the minimum amount. Absolutely. I don't think there's any meaningful chance that there will be renewal of the opportunity to, to count indirect jobs under a regional center arrangement without a significant increase, at least to 850,000, 900,000. Um, and um, so, you know, that could make a difference. Uh, and it could be more. I mean, it could be a million or 1.1 million, 1.2 million. We just don't know. Yeah. And if, 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 if we had to handicap the, the likelihood of the renewal of the RC program, I would say it's 50, 50, maybe even less than 50%. And furthermore, as time passes, the chances go down because there are people out there saying, mm -hmm. look, why, why do we even need to renew this? We're, the, the, the EB-5 program is operating just fine now without the regional center layer on top of it. And, and so it, it's, it's, it's only getting worse. The chances I think are only going down as time progresses. Okay. Is that fair to say, Robert? <laughs> I, I generally do agree with that. I think as time goes on, the chances of renewal of the legislation that allows new filings goes down the chances of a grandfathering legislation for the investors who already invested only benefiting them goes up. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, it seems a lot of legal questions because uh, you know, um, they're at the stage of making a decision, obviously on the projects. Um, there's concerns about some of the consulates and embassy because some of them want to get, they need to get a police clearance when does do they have to get that police clearance? Because some countries, it's it's a slow process now getting that police clearance, especially with COVID. Mm -hmm. so, That's in the second stage. Yeah. So the first stage is to file the I five two six showing about the project, how they're going to use the money, and create the jobs, and where you got your money. Mm -hmm. That's that's all that's about. The second, once you get that approved, uh, then you go on to the visa application process, and that is when you have to come up with the uh, police certificate from the countries that you've lived in for, um, I think it's six months or more. Um, so so the, it, it's a while. I think it would be smart to look at all, you know, 
the minute you decide you're going to do this, you get working on your 526 sources, but you also start looking at, okay, what countries have I lived in? What's the process for getting the police clearance, uh, the police certificate, and maybe get started on, on getting those for some of those countries if they tend to take longer. Okay. So, so, so are they required to get any clearance, any documents from the local consulates, or it's all the submissions done from immigration in the U.S.? If they file an I-526, is there any, any documents they have to fill in from the local consulates, or is everything yeah. in the U.S.? Okay. Well, but, I mean, it's nothing necessarily from the U.S. I mean, it's just about, I mean, it's the papers that Steve would provide about the project. Mm -hmm. And the papers that the investor would provide about where their money came from, which probably is from their home country. But if they've been living in the U.S. then, or if they're getting a gift from an uncle in the U.S., then it would be papers that relate to the U.S. Okay. okay. So, Steve, uh, there's a few um, discussions in terms of the current projects that you have, the locations. And do you have plans for new locations? Yes. Uh, do, do, do they mean after this offering? Will after there be this offering? Yes. 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 In uh, perhaps a month or two, we'll 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 launch our, our next offering. Uh, so, uh, yes. So, how many slots do you have left on your current offering at the moment? Uh, either four or five, depending on. Um, but it's, it's about half subscribed at this point. Okay. We had nine, and we've got four or five committed. Okay. And, you know, I just noticed there's three Q and three questions that I, I cannot answer. And Robert has to leave in eight minutes. I wonder if we should, uh, we should ask Robert to, uh, for, for, for his advice on. I think Robert's been on the, the, the show of this webinar anyway. <laughs> so, um, well, so Robert can take the lead. Um, I'm happy to do that. So here, I'm looking at the three questions up here. <laughs> Will my B1, B2 application be affected if I apply for this? Yes. So. Many people already have a, a visitor visa in their passport that may be valid for many years going forward. And that would not be affected at all. I mean, of course, when you use that visa, come into the country, some port officer could ask you, do you have any green card application pending? Or, But that almost never happens. I mean, you just use your own experience. It, I'd be surprised if anybody on this webinar has ever actually had that asked of them as they seek to enter the country. Now, if you have, if you need to renew a visa mm -hmm. to get a new one mm -hmm. at the consulate, then that visa application does ask, has an immigrant petition ever been filed for you? And this I-526 petition that you have to file as the first step in the EB-5 process is an immigrant petition. So you would have to say yes. Now, does that mean you won't get the visitor visa? No, not, I mean, it, it's a, it's an issue that is raised for the consular officer to consider whether you intend to come and visit the United States. But, you know, you can have an intent to visit in the meantime and come back while you're working on trying to get permission to live permanently in the U.S. And I have had many clients, many clients from around the world who have received visitor visas when, you know, when they revealed that they had an I-526 petition pending still got the visitor visa. Can't guarantee it, you know, but nobody can ever guarantee they're gonna get a visitor visa from the United States. Okay. So, okay, let's see, next question. Do you have an E2 option that I can convert to EB-5? Now, I think I can speak for Steven saying no. This, what his offering does not allow uh, the, the investor to have basically 50% ownership of this entity, which would be required to qualify for the E2 visa. Now, you can you can make your own v investment in something else that wouldn't require 500 or $750,000 that could qualify you for an E2 visa. And you can come over here uh, in the near term using that while continuing to pursue the EB-5 through an investment with Steve or whoever. Um, so they're not, you know, you don't have to have the E2 and the EB-5 investment in the very same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, um, I think we've got another question from the Facebook, and it's again for Robert. Um, it's, an, it's an investor that's really concerned in two minds about applying for EB-5 uh, because his son is about to go to a very well-established university under an F1. 
So if he finds an F1, I think on the form, there is a requirement to say if they are filing for any other um, immigration. Or Th this is covered by the answer I just gave about the visitor visa. Yeah. The application form is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And the question is exactly the same. Has an immigrant petition ever been filed for you? So you say yes, and then they decide whether they're going to uh, issue you the student visa. I've had many, many, many clients who were issued an F-1 visa after they filed the I-526 and they still got it. Can't guarantee that's going to happen. And one thought is if you can arrange it to apply for the visitor visa, the F-1 student visa or the visitor visa before you actually file the petition uh, for I-526 so that you can say no to that question honestly uh, and then and, and get your visa. And meanwhile, you go ahead and file the I-526. Uh, not everybody could arrange the student visa application as quickly as that if they need to go ahead and get on with it to file the I-526, as I think they should, uh, but it's a possibility. Okay. Okay. Um, so there's just, I think we've answered the, the question that's on there, unless you want to add something to that. Uh, somebody's asking, what's the legal procedure to with the U.S. Embassy in your country to get the immigrant visa once you get the I-526 approved? That process is just designed, I mean, you have to have a police certificate just showing you haven't been convicted in any of the countries that you've lived for uh, six months or more. Mm -hmm. uh, and otherwise, you have your fingerprints taken when you go so they can run your, your fingerprints through Interpol and the U.S. databases to make sure you're not some criminal in another name. Otherwise, you answer just a bunch of questions that identify, well, you have to have a medical exam that that shows you don't have a contagious disease. But even with that, if you have something, I mean, and, and that you have required vaccinations, which now includes COVID, uh, and, and you have to show, I mean, if, if there is some uh, indication that you have something like hepatitis, well, I mean, you can get treatment and show you have arrangements for treatment in the United States and still get the visa. So otherwise it's just answering questions like, are you a terrorist? Are you coming here to, you know, hurt people. I mean, you know, these are not going to be problems. So it's really those issues that I mentioned. Okay. So I, I think Stephen, um, Robert, you, you've been amazing, and it's been a very much um, a further stage enhancement from the last webinar. Um, is there anything you would like to add, Steve and Robert, to and what advice would you give to uh, to the investors that are looking at the projects and want to file, you know, the, the EB five petitions. Well, I guess I would say if, if any investor is thinking that they want to wait until the regional center program comes back, I, that's bad. I think that's bad advice because it is so uncertain now. Whereas if they file their petition now, uh, I think they are likely to be granted expedited processing. Of course, I have to say it's it's cannot be guaranteed, but we have you know eight approvals now and no denials. And so it 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 seems to me they have a very good chance of getting granted expedited processing, having their petition placed at the front of the queue and knowing that it's just a matter of months before their petition is approved. So you know, they could be ready to come here in six months. That's the safe and to, route. And to add to that, Steve, I guess, to, you know, I talked about the calculus uh, earlier, but one thought is also that if you wait for the regional center investment opportunity, if it ever occurs, it, it might be very, I mean, a much higher level. Uh, but more important than that, all of the investors who are in the queue are going to be back in the queue and your, your investment is not likely to be expedited. You're going to be in a five-year waiting period to get your I-526 adjudicated. Mm -hmm. Even if there's no waiting list for the visa number because you're not from China, you still have a long time before you're gonna be able to get it. Very good advice, very good advice. Because there's a lot of people at this stage of deciding to wait for the regional center, reauthorization or file a direct um, yeah, you know, you know, position. So that's brilliant. Um, oh, hey, I need to add one thing just yes. as disclaimer that I always have to do, my law firm requires it, and that is neither I nor my law firm uh, promote or advocate uh, or vouch for any in investment opportunity. Um, even our client 
Steve, uh, we just never, you know, we don't, we don't advise people about which investment to pick. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, you know, our involvement is to help the investor pursue permanent residence based on their choice of which investment to pick. And then our goal is to just get them the green card based on that investment. Okay. Um, so, and, you know, we can help somebody regardless of which investment they pick. Um, and if they want to hold off, if they're still trying to figure it out, if they want to get started documenting their source of funds, we can help them with that. And if they choose some other investment opportunity, we're not going to try to talk them out of that. You know, we're agnostic about that. Um, okay. And let me add that, that Robert and I have been working together for 10 years. Okay. When, when was that anniversary? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew. I'd celebrate, but I, I didn't keep the uh, keep track of the exact date. It, 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 it was winter busy. somewhere. I remember <laughs> being cold when uh, Steve called me. Yeah. It, it, too busy working on the documents. Okay. Yeah. Um, so another question, do we have to stay for two years in the US only to be eligible to file the I-829? Okay, great question. Uh, the, the, you know, once you get the conditional permanent residence, you are now a permanent resident. It's conditional on later filing the 829 and showing that you kept your money in the business and that the jobs were created. But um, you are a permanent resident and the permanent resident card that you get is not a visitor card. And, and, it, and, and you can lose that card if you don't maintain a residency in the United States. And the only foolproof way to protect that is to be here in total more than half the time. Now, I'm not saying you have to be here more than half the time or you're going to lose your green card. That's not true. Do you mean half um, the time, six months in a year, or do you mean one year in two years? What, 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 can you just clarify that? I, I would, my advice to people is just never let any 12-month period go by without you having spent at least six months in the United States during that 12 month period. Just look at it every month on a rolling basis. Looking back, have I been here more than I have not? If you can always answer that question, yes, then there's almost no way you could have your green card taken away from you for abandonment. Um, now, people can play it, people have played it much closer to the line. And it's, you know, how low can you go? Uh, kind of the limbo question. Uh, nobody exactly knows. And the question, the, the legal issue is when you're coming back, can you convince the port officer uh, that when you left, you intended to be gone only temporarily and you did maintain a residence in the United States that you intended to keep and you were intending to live permanently in the United States. So if you take up work in the foreign country, that's a factor against you. If you don't have any home or ties in the United States, that's a factor against you. If you don't file tax returns in the United States as a resident, then that's a terrible factor against you. Um, so it's kind of a totality of, of circumstances. Uh, and I would just say, why risk it? If you want to get a green card, just be here half the time. But, but if you want to take more chances, you know, you can, and you might get away with it. And a lot of people do. Okay, brilliant advice. Thank you, Robert. Um, Steve, I think you, you, you've been typing away as, you know, your fingers must be hurting after the amount of types you've done. Um, so I don't know if you'd like to add anything to um, the audience. Um, I think we're, we're pretty much coming to an end on this webinar. Yeah, I think, uh, I th I think I've said everything. I'm happy to take any more questions though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, please. If there's any more questions, then we're happy to um, answer them live. S Steve, in terms of um, it, projects that are out there, people, obviously, you, I don't want you to make a comment in terms of um, the other projects. Why do you think investors are opting for your project, even though investment is, is, is at 750? Oh well, well, well. Clearly, it's because of the the expedited uh, expedite potential. Yeah, and I have to say potential again. But again, all of our investors have been granted expedited processing. None, none have been denied except for those first two, and the denial was you know reversed in in, in a few weeks. So every after the first two, 
you know, then the next six were just uh, granted expedited processing almost immediately. I mean, we're talking three weeks, mm -hmm. you know, and so, so that's, um, and, and that's the nice thing is that once, once, you know, once that granting of expedited processing comes in, mm -hmm. the investor knows that his or her petition is now at the front of the queue. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what happens with the regional center program. You know, you know that very soon, I mean, the, the only petitions ahead of you are, are other, other expedited petitions, mm -hmm. you know, which at this point, the total is eight. So it's, you know, just a matter of months. Uh, before you know that your your petition is approved, and then you can come to the U.S. Okay, so we we do have a few agency as well. Should they reach out to you directly, uh, Steve? What what would you advise? Yes. You? Yep. Okay. And uh, yep. we have another question: If I make my partner the main applicant, can I get more flexibility on my travel? I guess this is a question for Robert. Right. I don't know the I don't know the answer to that question, Robert. I think you like he's, you've sorry, he's gone. Oh, he's gone on another meeting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you've expedited him to the next meeting. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so what we, we will do, if there's any more legal questions, um, please uh, drop us a line or send us a message and um, we'll forward that over to Robert and, uh, and, and so on and forth. And, um, you know, on behalf of Robert, thank you everyone for joining. And I think, Steve, you just need to do a, a closing statement, I guess. And um, we, we thank everyone for making that effort on a Saturday. Some people are in a lockdown, so they probably appreciated having a webinar on a Saturday, but um, that, that says a lot. So a final comment, Steve, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll close sure. up. Sure. Well, I think the time is now. And uh, and just to be clear, these these addiction treatment centers are owned by me and my partner Doug Leach, and we can we plan to continue to open more. Like I said, mm -hmm. uh, after this offering, uh, the next offering will be out in uh, perhaps two months, maybe maybe less than two months. But you know, everything is uncertain in terms of the the regional center renewal. So uh, the time is now. If you can if you can f afford it, uh, I think uh, the safest route is to file your petition now. Uh, but if you can't, uh, let's keep in touch because I, we will have a future offerings down the road and they will they will likely be expedited too, unless there is a, a let up in uh, the addiction problem in this country. And there's just no there's no there's nothing on the horizon that would indicate there's there's a let up in, the, in this problem. So thank you very much, Sam and everybody uh, for watching. And please feel free to reach out to me with any further questions. joining our webinar. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Robert, um, for your expert advice. And um, please um, reach out to Steve, reach out to the team, and we're happy to um, share the updated video or any, any other information that you need. Steve, thank you again. You have a wonderful day. And everyone, God bless. Um, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.